in the American <laughs> company. Is there someone here who's going to let us know what's going on? I'm Sam Faris. I'm the superintendent on the job for Italy American Construction. Uh, yeah, we're talking about the property located at 13347 Hart Avenue. The, uh, the lot is 107 long by 55 uh, wide. Kind of a short lot for the garage, but I think uh, when I spoke to Hank about a month ago, he said if I split the difference between the back offset and keeping the garage corner and the house corner eight feet apart, we might have a good chance at it. Uh, Mr. Zeldorf would like the opportunity to be able to store his car and his property uh, in his garage, which he has no garage right now. And then we're, we're going to add a, an apron and a new patio on the side of it as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, for the record, the patio uh, and an apron would not require an action of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, Okay. Joe, good. did you want to did you want to add anything, Joe? Or are you good? No, he. Uh, He's got gotcha. you. He, he said he said it right on point. I just want to. Okay. All right. Hi, Joe. How you doing? Okay. Mr. Chair, if he's done, I've got a couple things. I'm going to put up a PowerPoint so we can kind of show a little bit about what's going on here with this. Um, Please do. Hold on. We're going to give this a shot here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically what we have is an appeal from Italy American. Uh, they want to allow the structure eight feet from the principal structure instead of the required 10 and an accessory structure three feet three feet from the rear property line instead of the required six. You have the code section cited. Here's the whys the codes exist. The six feet off the back is typically what's preserved as an Edison easement or a utility easement. Mm -hmm. And that's a result of why we made that our rear accessory structure setback as a result of that so that the two would coincide. What happened with the other part is that it should be no closer to 10 feet to the principal building or another accessory mm -hmm. building. The reason for that is, is to maintain fire separation. So based on the plans that Italy America submitted, Italy American, excuse me, Sam, uh, has submitted, and some of Mr. Zildorf's issues, which we'll get into here, um, I was able to get the building official to already waive the 10 feet, but it's still in our code. So it requires an action of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the three feet set back off the rear and the eight off between the two buildings. So having said that, Mr. Zildorf has a very unique situation. I don't know, can you guys see my cursor here? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. so his lot is only 107 deep. Typically the lots in Huntington Woods are uh, actually uh, 125. So you're looking at typically 50 by 125 or 6,250 square foot lots. The issue that Mr. Zildorf has is that his lots were originally platted off of Coolidge and were originally designed. If you can see that the arrows running a different way towards Coolidge, they were all 20 foot lots was originally going to be set up for storefronts. So as a result, because they developed it as residential rather than commercial property over the years, many, many, many moons ago, the properties became shorter along Coolidge in a lot of instances. And Hart, for example, was always going to be our downtown. That's why a lot of the lots are 20, 40, 60, because they were multiples of 20 foot lots. So that's how that came about. But it does give him a unique situation here at only 107 feet deep. He doesn't have a whole lot of room. So he doesn't have, if he was 127, 125 feet deep, we wouldn't be here right now because he'd have plenty of room to do it all the way. This is what he's looking at doing. There's a simple garage that's going in here with three feet in the back, three feet off the side, which meets code, and eight feet from the property here, which would match the existing residence. Because of the shape of the house, because not all the houses are the same, his house is a little bit longer than it is wider. As a result, he gets closer to it. If his house was shorter and fatter, he wouldn't have the nice wide driveway that he has, but he would have a less of a problem trying to meet this. 
So this is kind of where Joe is at right now with this. So we go to the standards, special or unique circumstances, which are peculiar to the land structure or building involved, which are not generally applicable to other land structures or buildings in the same district. Again, the lot at only 107 feet deep is way shorter than most all the lots in Huntington Woods, which are typically 125. Standard two, the variance will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the general welfare. Again, his lot borders Coolidge and the garage would be on that side of the lot. So as a result, you don't have any real neighbor interference. It's unlikely that it would cause an issue and we've had no adverse comments from neighbors. And it's unique in his situation too because his appeals and his notice area also extends into Oak Park because of the 300 feet. Standard three, the special conditions and circumstances do not result from the actions of the applicant. The lot size was determined long before Mr. Zildorf purchased the home and he had a reasonable expectation that a, a garage would be allowed at some point in time. Again, the type of the garage that Mr. Zildorf has proposed is not anything that would be considered overly large and it's actually of minimum size. Oops. Now standard four is the literal interpretations of the provision of this ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district under the terms of the ordinance and that the variance is the minimum necessary. Again, I explored with DTE. Um, you had a letter from uh, DTE in your packet. DTE <laughs> holds no easement which would have precluded issuing a rear, a rear variance. So this is one that can be granted. Typically, if it was in the DTE was holding the easement in the rear of the property, they would have to vacate that easement in order to make a variance even feasible for us. Uh, additionally, any other service wires or drops would have to be worked by Mr. Z would have to be worked out by Mr. Zildorf or his representatives with DTE. So, if there's a service drop that's coming in where the garage is, they would have to swing that to a different spot. That's not uncommon. That happens. DTE does work with it. Also, in Michigan, of course, a garage is a reasonable and prudent use of the property in our climate. It just is. It always has been. Again, we also had the building officials allowing the eight feet between the structure and the house subject to the zoning board granting the same type of permission for that. And again, his lot not only doesn't have the garage to protect his vehicles in the Michigan climate, but there's also concerns from his proximity to Coolidge. Having the garage over there would also give his backyard some more privacy and allow him to have some room and also deaden the noise. So that would be helpful for that. Other than that, that's all I have on that. If there's any questions, I'm sure Mr. Zildorf, Mr. Carice, or myself would be happy to answer them. Hank, <clears throat> Hank you are allowing the, uh, the eight foot separation. Is there any provision to put in a firewall? There, he looked at what we were talking about and he said that that would be fine the way that it is. The building official was fine with that. Okay. So a firewall would be something that he would go over. Um, if there's a material makeup that differs from what it is, that wouldn't be something that the ZBA would be concerned with. That would be something that Dwayne would pick up. Okay. <clears throat> and Mr. Freese and I have already had a discussion about that, and I think they're fine with it. They just want the garage, and they, they quite frankly, need it. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I did spec the firewall on the front of the garage and the, the side closest to the property line as well. Okay. Yeah, that's... Okay, that's positive. Uh, I would like for discussion among the commissioners. Anybody want to uh, raise any issues or talk about it? Well, I think that he did his homework and as far as uh, there's no easement in the back and we've got an agreement for the building officials for the eight foot uh, from the house. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, prudent that everybody should have a two car garage. So I, I'm, I'm in pretty much in favor of this, uh, of this, um, Middle. I have I have no questions. It's pretty straightforward, and uh, I appreciate the homework everybody's done. Okay, I would like to open up the discussion for public participation. Is there any person out there in the public who wishes to address us about this issue? If you could, Mr. Chairman, if you could ask them to state their name and address when and if they participate. Thank you. Do we have someone or not? 
No, we don't. Nope. That was easy. Yeah. All right. I'm going to close public participation and open it up to discussion of the commissioners with the uh, hope of getting getting some type of motion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with what with what the other commissioner said earlier. Um, so uh, unless anyone has anything else to say, I, I'll make a motion to grant the variance to allow the accessory structure eight feet from the principal structure uh, instead of the required 10 feet and the accessory structure three feet from the rear property instead of the required six. Um, is there a second? I'll second it. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 How's that look, Hank? Okay, we've got it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zildorf. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I, I, I have a question, Hank. Yeah. So we'll, uh, will the permit be issued with the paperwork that I've already submitted? Uh, call me tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank everybody on the board, too. I appreciate that. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? I have, I have lost the screen. And, uh, the better? Okay. I'm good. Just got to hit okay. the button. All right. We need to move on to the next. Oh, maybe that wasn't on. Hank? Yes. This is Mike. Can can we get uh, people who are speaking to mute there? Yeah, if, you uh, know what? If if you're not speak, could you put your mics on mute, please? So we're getting a lot of interference. So if we could do that, and then you know, if you have something to say, please unmute, or when the chairman calls on you. Thank you. All right. The next one that I see is eight two one one Henry. Is that right, Hank? Thank you, yes. Uh, Mr. Cates, I believe, is here. And I've seen Eric in here as well, although, I'd, yes, he's here. So uh, they would be ready to go when you are, Mr. Chair. I'm ready. OK. All right. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to our, our variance requests. Um, we're asking for two for a 2 one Henry. The first is for a semicircular driveway um, that has one entry on Hendry and the other on Ivanhoe. The circumstance is similar to a variance that was granted in 2017 for 26457 Huntington. Um, the house sits on a corner lot with a two car garage on the side. The driveway that leads up to the garage is too short to support the parking of any cars without them obstructing the sidewalk. So essentially, despite it being a, a, a lot that's three tenths of an acre, it can only support uh, the garage parking of two cars. Um, so any other cars would have to be parked on the street. Additionally, the both um, sides of the street that are adjacent to the property on Henry and on Ivanhoe are fire lanes. So anyone who, any guests or anyone who needs to park on the property has to park you know, across the street in front of neighbors' houses, um, crossing the street, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, the, the solution, um, and we worked with Arik, and Arik's uh, talked to Hank as well, um, the best solution that we could come up with is a semi-circular driveway, allowing for additional parking um, and making entry shorter, especially for, you know, our parents and stuff um, so that they, uh, you know, um, they, they get around, but they're in the upper years, so we don't want them having to cross the street, especially in the wintertime and such. Uh, we've contacted um, a number of the neighbors, um, um, all of which have shown no objection to the driveway and definitely appreciate and, and would prefer people parking on the property versus on the street. So that's the first. Do you want me to keep going to the second one or, or pause yes, there? Please. Yes, please. Right. Well, Gordon, if it's okay, I've set up my PowerPoint in two separate okay. things, one for the first and one for the other. Right. So mm -hmm. if, if it's okay with uh, Mr. Cates, why don't we do one at a time because they... Absolutely. You know, yeah. That, that's fine with me. Proceed. Okay, I don't know if Arik had anything he wanted to add, and then 
I, I just want to add that also on the side adjacent to the garage, there is a, a electrical pole and there's a guy wires that's prevent from any uh, additional car, uh, car parking on the property. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, uh, basically um, what we have here is we've got an appeal for 8211 Hendry. The house sits on the corner lot uh, of Ivanhoe and Hendry. Uh, it's typically we don't have, although there are some in this district, in th this particular zone district, they don't have, they, ha they have a lot of at least 150 to 160 feet and a depth of at least 40 feet for a circular driveway. Um, that's what the code says, which really made it so that only R1A lots, which are the big lots in the center of Huntington Woods, could have a semicircular driveway. Uh, in order to have them, you must comply with all the following conditions. Uh, again, no more than two drives and uh, the semi-circular driveway shall join the straight driveway before entering the public right-of-way. The problem with that is, as you'll see as I get into this and throw up some pictures, it just doesn't work. Um, and again, the second one is a variance for something else. So here's what we have. Here we have an overhead view here and you can see with my cursor, this is Hendry. On this side of the street here, that's a fire lane. On this side of Ivanhoe, that's a fire lane. Right here, where Rick was talking about, is the guy wires. So you can't even put an extra lane or an extra parking place here. So that's not an option for that because that holds up the Edison pole, which holds up the transformer for this area. Um, so what we have here is one of the few other things that we can do. In talking to Arik, we took a look at what he could do. He didn't have the radius over here to make a complete semi-circle driveway and still stack cars. And realistically, part of this is not only to function drop off and service of the house, but to have a place to park. Over here on this part that you can see here, he doesn't have room to park a car without overhanging the driveway. So it's a problem with that. So when you look at the standards and how this applies to the standards, again, the special or unique circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land or the structure or building involved, which are not generally applicable to other land structures or buildings in the same district. There's like maybe two or three of these in the entire city that have the problem that Mr. Cates is facing here. The corner lot does not have parking on either border street because of a fire lanes. And then the other issue becomes is that if you have a snow emergency, even if he could park on there, he'd have to move the cars. Where's he gonna put them? So he has no capability for that. In the code, it says that the driveway or the garage actually counts as one space. And because he can't park his vehicles overhanging the sidewalk, he's got no place to park this. If he does that, it's a ticketable offense. So that kind of addresses standard one and then continued again, this is one of a very select few that run into this situation. In the <clears> past, <throat> the ZBA did grant a similar approval for the same situation. Um, it's really not possible to do the turning radius. So as a result, they have one entry or exit on Hendry and one entry or exit off of Ivanhoe, which allows them space to park approximately three to four cars in the front if they have to and uh, keeps them off the street. Standard two is the variance will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the general welfare. The contention could be made that it would suffer, neighborhood would suffer less injury if this is granted as the family cars and guests would not be taking up the spaces in front of all the other houses. So as a result, it's not less likely that this would harm anybody and more likely that this would help people. I know particularly on my street at certain times, it's hard to find a space that you can park in front of my house, let alone, and I'm in the middle of a block more or less, and Mr. Cates is on a corner and he's got nowhere to park. So anybody that comes over to his house would be a problem as far as parking. Uh, standard four is the literal interpretation of the provisions of this ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights that commonly, uh, hold on one second here for me. I just got myself ahead. I guess got a little ahead of myself here. Okay. In standard three, 
um, which didn't come through on this copy, but it is the special conditions and circumstances do not result in the actions of the applicant. You know, Mr. Cates neither uh, platted the house, platted the lot, platted the streets, created the fire lanes, created the Edison pole, created the guy wires that necessitate the Edison that help, you know, with the Edison pole, or platted the house on the lot. Because if you see where the garage is, there's no place to put anything. He could, even if garages move back, he could add more parking on his property, but he doesn't even have that option. <clears throat> and then standard four, a literal interpretation of the provisions of this ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district. Um, and that this is a minimum necessary. The house has no on-street parking, unlike most in the city. And they can't park in their driveway without violating the code. The lack of vehicle storage and placement handicaps the owner as to ease of visitors and their own storage as there really is no usable driveway. This picture on the left is the front of Mr. Cates's house. You can see the tree, so a driveway would come in and go around right here. <clears throat> this right here shows the side of the house, excuse me. Wow. Um, and this right here, is, he can't fit cars here without overhanging the sidewalk here. Here's the guy wires right here that uh, Arik had mentioned. Over here, this shows that this is, as you're looking down Hendry to the house right here, which is over here, it's a no fire, it's a fire lane. There are no parking fire lanes on, on, on both sides. So he really has nowhere to park. This is a previous variance granted for the same situation. If you can see right here, here's one side street, here's the other side street. And as a result, it comes around through here, the front and comes out on the other side of the lot. And these lots are about the same size. So reality wise, this works. It was granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. It works, it's worked in the past. And what you have here is almost the identical situation to what he's had before. So having said that, um, for this part of it, Mr. Chairman, um, I'll turn it back to you. And then if we can go to the other part of the variance that he's seeking. Okay. <clears throat> is there any discussion among the commission members right now? Just for clarification, the, you're going to end up with three curb cuts from this house. Is that that right? is correct. So the variant, the, the principal um, aspect of the variance being requested is to have that to maintain that that entrance to the existing garage, along yes. with that. That's that the correct. problem. That is correct. Well, that's one of the problems, but yes. Well, and. It, yeah, that's one of the problems. Are there other problems? Well, other than there's no other way to give him real parking on the property. No, I understand the rationale, but I mean, what are the, I'm trying to get a feeling for what the variance is. The variance would be to allow a uh, semicircular driveway with two entryways uh, in an, a different district than the R1A, and he would be in the R1C uh, district. Is this a U in the R1C district as opposed to the R1A? So circular driveways are not permitted in the in this. That district. is correct. So it's really is this a use variance, really? Is that right? We don't see many of those. Yeah, we don't we don't see too many of these at all. And again, this is one of the few. It's like I said, it's the only thing that like we granted before. It's the same thing we don't get. We just don't have it where there's no two, where there's two fire lanes combined. It's so, like the perfect storm, unfortunately. Do, do you agree that it's a use variance and not a structural or dimensional variance? Um, I'm a little confused on that because the use variances have a, are more uh, stringent conditions. Yeah, I, I think it's a dimensional variance because the use hasn't changed. It's still a single family residence. Uh, so the driveway is not a... a the driveway way. would not be use variance. It would be a dimensional okay. variance. And I'm basing that on the fact that the use of the property has not changed. Making it more usable has, right, <laughs> depending on you guys, but... All right. Quick, quick question. The, just for my own uh, clarification, the, R, the, the, the other lot, the RA, where those are permitted in the, within the city? Yeah. Um, that, Those are the big lots down by where you're at, Todd. 
not, not, not where I live. Um, okay. No, it's, but I, so it's just it's just clearly a size of the lot different. That, that is correct. All right. Because I'm trying to think through. Um, the, the problem is, is that without the 150 to 160 square lineal feet on the frontage, you can't make a turning radius that makes right. sense. Right. Okay. So this is the only way. So going from one street to the other is the only way that makes sense, not unlike the one that we had from the previous. Right. Okay, thanks. All right, Hank, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna open it up for public participation on this particular issue. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to make a statement for this particular part? Not seeing. Go ahead. Sorry. Mark, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, Mark Nakasher, 25505 Wareham. Uh, I'm a neighbor and friend of the case. Uh, I've seen the property. Uh, I do believe that the suggestions they're making would be incredibly useful and um, make a lot of sense based on the property and the, the surrounding streets. So uh, I, I have no issue just as a neighbor and I'm in favor of what they're doing. Thank you for that, Mark. Anybody else uh, in the public wish to speak? I had something I, will. I wanted to say. Oh, go on. Go I, on, Linda. Well, I I just think that... Um, but who's, you who's, know, share, who's speaking now? Linda, Linda Solomon. Solomon. I'm a neighbor. Should we get an introduction and an address just for the minutes? Thank you for yep. referencing minutes facilitation earlier. 8246, no, 8246 eight, eight, Huntington. So um, I'm a neighbor and I, you know, people have lived in that house. Three adults have lived in the house with three cars for many years and they have been able to park in the short driveway and the house next to them or the, the, the garage next to them also has, in fact, right now there's two cars, there's two cars in the driveway and two cars in the same short driveway that's not overhanging the sidewalk. And I think that, um, you know, the house on Huntington that got the variance years ago is setting a precedent for, you know, there's a lot of other people that would like circular driveways too. In fact, Kitty Corner to the house that we're, is under discussion right now, for years they tried to get a circular drive that was turned down for, I'm not even sure what the reasons are, but because it was an additional curb cut um, and they were elderly and, um, you know, they, they never got that, but there's other houses that could qualify. And I'm just afraid that this house, you know, you did it for Huntington, you're, it sounds like you're moving towards, I mean, you've certainly defended the, this one for Hendry. And it just, to me, is like the start of my parents who live next door, they also would like a circular drive. So you're gonna end up not being able to defend the current law that says this, or whatever it is, the ordinance that says that they're not allowed, you know, this is just gonna, open it up to a lot of houses that have a lot of frontage and um, you know you're going to have all these circular drives and that's going to really change the neighborhood it's going to be less water being absorbed into the ground because there's more concrete there's more curbs or you know uh, traffic situations for kids on bikes adults on bikes and i really think that um you know less trees it's, it's um, they haven't even lived in the house or tried it, tried making it work yet. You know, the house has been there for 70 years and they've had company, they've had multiple cars. You know, I don't think that um, it's really a necessity and I don't wanna see the neighborhood changing so that all, it's all circular drives. And I, that, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Linda. Is there anyone else who wishes to make a comment from the public? Yes, we would like to make a comment. This is uh, I results. I'm uh, I live at eight two three three Henry, right next door, um, and there it's very. I agree completely with uh, the proposal. 
it is extremely difficult to uh, live on Henry nowadays. People are flying up and down the street at 40 miles an hour. The street is not that wide and the parking um, uh, across the street is very difficult if you have young kids or, or, or family over uh, and walking across the street and up the driveway is it's a long way if it's raining if you're carrying something if you're older uh, it's it's a tremendous benefit it enhances the functionality of the neighborhood it enhances the value of the properties and so we are in full support it is certainly not an eyesore the driveways are generally beautifully landscaped and you hardly even notice it they blend right in so we are in full support of the proposal Thank you very much for your comment. Are there any other members of the public who wish to make, make a comment? Yes, I would, Gordon. Okay, Gail, Gail Linden, 25840 Concord Road. Um, I'm quite familiar with the house when it belonged back to the Broders when I grew up here in Huntington Woods. Um, having served on the Zoning Board of Appeals, I just wanted to bring, you know, and everybody knows it. Um, Precedent is really not an action that is uh, one that you look at because something else has already been granted. Every case is taken on its own and to be evaluated on its own. And I think that this has positives and negatives to it. Um, I sat on the board when the house that um, Linda is addressing was turned down because it didn't have enough frontage for a full circular drive. I know the house next door, um, does have a full circular drive and I know the driveway is short here. I know one of the issues that was different on the Huntington Roadhouse is it sided to Borgman and there was no parking on Borgman at all and then the fire lane in front so you only had one place to be able to park. So I just bring it in saying that there are good reasons for it with the, with the wire or whatever else but I think the case needs to be taken on its own and not set a precedent for other cases to come along. I'd hate for every corner house to come to the Zoning Board of Appeal and say, this one was granted before, so let us have it. That's not the reason that Zoning Board of Appeal grants are given. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Gordon, yeah, just for some clarification here, because I, I just wanna make sure that this isn't being misunderstood. This particular house has no parking fire lanes on both sides on the side of the house and on the front of the house as did the house on Huntington. The reason that the Huntington house is brought up because it was given and offered and approved as an equitable solution to a problem that is unique to these type of houses. The houses on the other sides of the street and even the house that you know uh, Linda's address which I also know very well has a longer driveway and is able to park at least two cars in the garage and four before it even hits the sidewalk. Um, so they, they are different. The, the lots are different. The houses are different. And I understand, um, you know, Linda's trepidation for not wanting there to be a lot of traffic or cars going. But realistically, and also the fact that the house has been there for so long and people haven't had problems with it, a lot of times the people don't enforce or public safety or whatever, for whatever reason, doesn't write tickets for parking over the sidewalk, but it is a law and I can't give anybody permission to do that. So having said that, I just wanted to clarify what the situation is. <clears throat> Linda's got a valid point and it's well within her rights to bring it up. Um, but there are some circumstances that are different with this lot than the lot that was kitty corner. Thanks, Hank. Um, <clears throat> is there any other member of the public that wishes to speak about this issue? Not seeing any, I will close public participation and start discussion among the co commissioners. I just, uh, Todd here, I just want to say that, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the point that uh, Gail made, I was going to bring that up as well. You know, everything is on its own merit. Uh, we don't set any precedent. Uh, we do have discussions when this happens about, you know, what were the issues before, uh, but it all, everything is done on its own individual case. Um, but uh, Linda did bring up a good point about the water. Um, we've had this discussion as well with the, the, the cement and runoff and is, Hank, does that come into play at all with the driveway and the lot size and all that good stuff? 
No, they'll still maintain all their, uh, they'll still maintain their stormwater on site. And uh, somebody else brought up a point about mm -hmm. how they look and landscaping. The standards that would be held in the R1A would be the same standards that would be held in this particular lot, meaning there'll be bushes, there'll be landscaping so that this doesn't become a focal point. And I believe that Dr. Zaltz had the same issue when he came up and he was landscaping and he had to do when they were redoing his stuff. So I think that there's a lot uh, that, that goes into this. It's not simply just, you know, run the asphalt machine through there and call that good. Um, but there's some drainage. There won't be any flow going from the driveway that hits the sidewalk uh, and creates a hazard, that type of thing. So there may have to be some landscaping modifications, but it's no different than we would with any driveway installation anywhere else. Okay, thanks. Uh, just just one last question. Uh, no trees would be harmed in this uh, adventure? Uh, let me pull this up real quick to make I sure. Didn't I didn't see any, but um, again, that was another good point. We Yeah, they're not going to miss it. None of the city trees are going to be problem by the way that Arik designed this. And uh, if you take a look at it, Oh, well, and you have your materials, but uh, the public doesn't. But you can see that it's swung right up towards the front, and it doesn't go straight up. It goes around the tree that's on the front corner of the lot. So, I mean, the way that it was designed was taken care of to come out and not mitigate, you know, where there's any city trees or anything like that either. So there's okay. none shown on the plan, and it's my understanding they don't anticipate disturbing it. Okay, thanks. Hank, I'd like to ask you a question bearing yes, on the, the precedent issue. Yes, sir. In on the, the previous instance that you cited on Huntington, what does the record say as to the reason we granted? Because there was no other relief that was possible for the house. So they had less parking than any other house could be expected to maintain. And their garage came off of Borgman and as a result, they had no spaces to park the vehicles in the amount that were registered to the house. So they couldn't do that. And then also they had to have a place for guests to park and you couldn't have any place close by for people to park. Is that, what, no, was that a corner house? Yes, it's the same thing, yeah. Did they, were there fire lanes on both streets? Yes, there were. I, yeah. I, I mean, you certain to... aspects of, of what you just said seem to me irrelevant such as the number of cars registered to the house. I, I know, that, but that's how they determine if they're allowable for on-street parking in the first place is the reason I bring it I up. mean, I, what I'd like, I, I think the issue with precedent, which has already been discussed somewhat, we, we wrestle with that every time we have an appeal. And the way that you deal with the issue of, of your slippery slope issue is to have a carefully worded statement in the record of approval that distinguishes the facts that gave rise to the approval of a variance from other facts that wouldn't. So that the next person who comes along might have a valid argument if you refuse them, if they have very similar facts pertaining to their situation. And, and that's why I asked about Huntington. So I think the one thing, if, if we're inclined to approve this, we have to lay out in our motion the rationale. Uh, I, I noticed that I, I thought Hank, that you laid out the rationale very well in your in your analysis, but then in the actual motion, it doesn't say anything. Yeah, I think what what you're going to have to do is you're going to create that record yeah. in your motion. So if you wanted to, or somebody wanted to craft a motion using any of the language that I used in describing the situation, absolutely feel free to do so. They all contribute towards okay. what the ultimate need is they all describe you know where you where where uh mr cates and Arik would like us to go with this so having said that if there's any questions with respect to that that's fine but i i, I would think that you would lay out uh that this might be a little bit more extensive motion which is why i wanted to take them separately um because it's too otherwise I didn't want to convolute the two issues that you had going here. So this is why this one I wanted to get separate. Do you want to have a vote on one by one on the on these two variances? Well, there's so, two variances. I should ask the chair. So, is that your plan? I'm flexible. Um, it seems that we may need to have two votes. I don't know uh, whether that's the case or what should happen, but we've been talking about this first one for a while 
So my opinion is, is that we take a vote now and then work on the second issue. Does anybody dis dispute that? Mitch? No. Oh, no, I don't. Okay. I'm looking for a motion then on the first issue uh, on this property at 8211 Henry. <clears throat> Anybody on the board? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was I was muted. Sorry. Um, I I would move to grant variance, but I think we have to have some of the additional um, detail that Mitch said. Are we looking to add that in now? I I, I would suggest to, to you that um, when you're going through this, that your motion should incorporate how it addresses the four standards. Uh, like for example, right. uh, move to approve uh, due to the fact that this meets the four standards in the following manner and then incorporate like uh, the corner lot poses an issue is there's no parking on either border street on the property on, on either side due to the property having fire lanes on both sides. Uh, the garage being too close to the sidewalk. So depending on the vehicle, they can't park without creating a ticketable offense by blocking the sidewalk. Those are the kind of things that should be incorporated into the motion. I, I think you have named the two uh, most persuasive rationales. And the way I, I was sort of trying to avoid having to craft it, but <laughs> my, my thought, I think the way you would put it, Hank, if you like that approach to say that, that, you know, move to approve on the basis that the appeal satisfies the four principal standards in, and in particular, and then you add your, your facts. You know the the fire lanes and the short driveway. It's it's hard to approve this because it really is a major change to have three entrances and exits to the street from one house. It's not it it, it seems reasonable, but on the other hand, it's a major variance in my view. Hmm. Not not just like an extra couple foot of house or something. No, but, you know, and again, when you go from there, you can also go to uh, standard four and use, uh, um, you know, the house having no on-street parking, unlike most others in the city, and uh, the vehicle storage and placement handicaps the owner, and this does some substantial justice. Well, it does have on-street parking. It's just across the street. Right, but then again, if there's a snow emergency, there's no place that you can put your cars on the lot. I think the safety factor is pretty persuasive. Um, the gentleman who spoke earlier, the cars do go very fast down Hendry. Um, and the fact that you can't park right in front of the house, I think lends itself to, to supporting this. Cars exceed the speed limit on Hendry? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you ought to, if that's true, you ought to be able to park across the sidewalk, you know. I'd start with enforcing the speed limit. That I can't help you with. Yeah. <clears throat> but I know who can. So, uh, forgive me, where are we in this process? Has A motion has been made, right? No, not by me. A sad, pathetic Mitch's, motion has Mitch's been made. started one. Okay. I, I haven't. I've just given, I given some, perhaps, um, excessive advice on the form of the motion, but I'm, I don't want to make the motion. Okay. Can, can Mitch and I uh, a huddle on his advice? I already. You can, it's an open meeting. You could do whatever you would like uh, to do as long as it's in the public. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> want to make sure. And it's very rare that Mitch and I agree on anything. That's you, right. you could, you know what, Todd? You could start. You could craft a motion, and then if somebody wants to make a friendly amendment, they can certainly offer it. All right. I'm, I'm flick, flipping through my content here. So I, I make a motion to grant a variance at 8211 Hendry uh, to allow a semi-circular driveway in the R1C zone district. Um, and that it uh, meets the uh, uh, special issues or issues with the four standards uh, in particular, uh, looking at um, we go to standard one and, and work through one, two, three, and four. I think what we want to say here, if I may butt in. Yeah, go right ahead. I'm that, waiting for you. <laughs> that 
the the layout of the property and the regulations uh, applicable to the two adjoining streets pose a practical difficulty for the ordinarily expected use of and of this property for part for off street parking number 1 the driveway between the, the sidewalk and the garage is too short. Number two, both streets adjoining have fire lanes that prevent uh, parking on the same side of the street as the house. Those would qualify as practical difficulties and meet the requirements for a variance. Is that good, Hank? It's good by me. If, if Todd's good with Mitch's amendment to his motion. I am. I'm just looking to make sure we didn't miss one of the Again, it's the historical factor that helps us, or whoever's here in uh, one year to five years, 10 years. I, I'm oh, good. I think that's all you got, Todd. I, by the way, it's not an amendment to your motion, it's just part of your motion. Yes, Add, adding um, to it, that's fine. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what seems similar to the Huntington case. Yeah. And, and it's a true statement of facts. Right, I agree. So, Mr. Chair, now you need a second. <clears throat> uh, who wishes to second? I'll second that. Thank you, Joe. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any, I ask for a vote. All those who approve, say aye. 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 All those against? Make a note that Mitch voted against it. Okay, it passed. So we are on our way to the. No, we have a we have a second issue. Yeah, you have a second uh, portion of the variance of a separate variance for this address. Right. Okay. Um, so if Matt, we want, you, Mr. Cates. Yeah, Matt, do you want to uh, uh, start there? Sure, definitely. I, I appreciate all the time um, and attention to to the first one. Um, the second one is to a variance of 418 and a half square feet, um, of which 394 is uh, essentially existing. It's a three season room that um, exists with the house that we want to close. The other 24 and a half feet is essentially um, at the back of the house, there's this little area where you exit the garage and then turn and you enter the house. Um, that space is currently actually has three walls to it, as well as a, a ceiling or roof. We just want to kind of close that fourth wall so you can enter directly into the house. So um, those are the, the two pieces, the 394 existing, the 24 and a half is three walls and a ceiling that we just want to add a, add a fourth to. Um, that's the quick overview. Thanks, Matthew. Hank? Okay. Uh... Let's see here. Okay. Can everybody see that? Not yet. The no. screen, not yet. Okay, hold on. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, basically what we have here is we have a request that sounds a lot bigger than it actually is. Back when we redid the zoning ordinance, a lot of the property and maximum house sizes got lowered. So as a result, because they didn't want people overbuilding on lots. Having said that, that ZO is in place and this is where it comes to the 418.5 square feet. 394 square feet of that is existing. So it would be legal non-conforming. And 24.5 is new. The standards, which I'll go over, and then there's a couple pictures in here too. In fact, you know what, let me do this here. Uh, yeah, let me do it this way. Uh, special unique conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land structure building involved, which are not generally applicable to other land structures or building the same distance, in the same district. The garage extends past the portion of the house. So putting the egress outside. 
So they just wish to enclose it. So they leave the garage into an enclosed area and go into the house. The total ask is uh, 415, but the actual ask is only 24.5. They just need to enclose it. And as soon as they enclose it, that becomes part of the landscape. Uh, the variance will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the general welfare is not visible to anybody. So that's one of the things. And we've had no adverse communications, although somebody did stop in the office to take a look at the plans. This area back here, if you can see my cursor, that's what they're looking to cover. So this area here is the garage. They walk out and they can go into the house. So all they're looking to do is to extend the roof and cover this so that when you walk out of the garage, you can come into the house without having to go outside and then back inside. So that's what they're looking to do with this. Again, on standard three, the special conditions and circumstances do not result in the actions of the applicant. The house and the layout were all well in place prior to the Kate's impending purchase. Uh, the original design is what created the issue here. Again, if you take a look here, this little area right here is what they're looking at doing. So that when they step out of the garage, they can go into the house. That's what really this 24 feet is all about. Standard four, a literal interpretations of the provisions of this ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district under the terms of this ordinance and the variance is the minimum necessary. Um, if they just covered the roof completely, they could have it, but it would, be, it would not be weather tight. If they covered it, then they could have a weather tight room. So that's one of the things. Uh, they want to enclose it and create a natural egress and ingress to that. And most attached garages offer a practical egress and ingress to the house. That would be the purpose of them. So having said that, um, this was really, there's not really a whole lot to explain with this. Um, I will go back to this because I think I have another picture here. No, I don't. Um, but you can take a look at it and see from this part right here where the space is that it's not visible from Ivanhoe, it's clearly not visible from Hendry, and depending on the landscape here, I'm not convinced it's visible from this property owner here, which I believe is a Zaltz property. Um, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them, as I'm sure Mr. Green is, or Mr. Katz. Cates, I'm sorry, I apologize. <clears throat> Thanks, Hank. Are there any commissioners who wish to make a comment at this time? Not seeing any, I'm going to open it up for public participation. Is there any member of the general public who would like to make a statement about this issue? Not seeing any, I'll close public participation. And I look to the commissioners to develop a discussion here. Let, let me, may I ask the, the Hank a clarifying question? Yes, sir. Yeah, please do. You, got, you, you have a, a house that's already oversized on, on the basis of zoning that it, rezoning that occurred after the house was built, right? That's correct. So it's, it's in dimensional terms, it's non-conforming to 390 some square feet. That's correct. That right? That's correct. All right. As it sits now. The, the little area that they're seeking to enclose, is that part of the 394? It is not. It is not, and the reason why? Because it's not enclosed. If it was enclosed and attached, then it would be. It would be considered part of a lot coverage, um, but the lot is huge. There's so not. It's sort of that, like a, it's like an uncovered porch, right? That's pretty much it. Yeah, it's it's not it, the the three sides that are there are there because one side is the garage, one side was the breezeway conversion, and the other side is the house proper. All right. Now, if if they did nothing with this twenty four foot area. And, and just left the house as is, would they need a variance for the 390 some? No. No, because it's not, it's a legal non-conforming use. That's correct, uh, right. Dimension correct. at this point. Correct. So uh, the, the thing I'm confused by is I understand that if you're, you're expanding your non-conformity by 24 feet, you need a variance for the 24 feet. But why, why do you suggest that a variance is needed for 24 plus the 390 some? 
I more did that more for informational reasons. The only thing that granting the total of the 415 would do is legitimize the others, which is already legitimized in some respects as a legal well, non-conforming structure. I mean, but they're not seeking to rebuild They're not the, seeking that, but they're seeking the 24.5. But if you can add the 24.5, the thought process was is that how could you reasonably expect to do that without legitimizing the 396? I think legally it's confusing because you can word it however you would like the, it. No, the only way I mean, I could see a situation if the house burned and they wanted to reconstruct it, say, I forget the figure, but let's say more than 50 percent, they would more. lose the 396 and they would lose their grandfathering and, and you would have to approve it as as a su substantial. That would be uh, correct. Variant. That's why you but would want to. Point, the, the 390 feet is quite legitimate as long as they're not expanding, rebuilding that, you know. So I, right. I don't see any basis for our reaching out to. Then you don't, then you don't have all. to. The, the point in the impetus for doing that was is that should you have also a calamity and something befell the house that it could be rebuilt to the same thing? Because yeah. realistically, if you gave them the 24 feet, if you didn't give them the 396, but the 24 I mean, feet wouldn't do them any good anyway. I can't for the life of me figure out what our argument would be to give them a 400 and some square foot variance. <laughs> that's that's up to you. If you want to word it and well, go for I, the 24.5, then you certainly are free to do well, so. Yeah, I mean, my comment is that I think it's very easy to support a request for enclosing that space. And then and that's what, then the that's what you might want to offer. 24, 24 foot square foot variance, and period. Then that's what you might want to offer. Well, okay. I don't know what the petitioner is seeking. Well, they're seeking the twenty-four point five square feet. They already have it. The point in asking for the three sixty to the three ninety-six was, is that if you legitimize the whole thing, then it saves them problems down the road. No, if I think their 24... house is not going to need rebuilding. So, okay, that's well, up let's to you. Cross that bridge. Let's close that bridge. Bridge. Let's come to it. And and you might hopefully you never do. I mean, yeah. the point is, thank you are making that proposal, not the petition. Well, the the point is, is that when our discussions were coming up, uh, the idea of legitimizing it for whatever purpose that may come from it, whether it be a fire calamity or some other reason down the road that we don't know or can't yeah. foretell at this point in time, that they would be able to rebuild it with that. But having said that, if the board is more comfortable oh. just going with the 24.5 feet, oh. To enclose that, then certainly you're free to do so. No, I just would say, for use a fancy legal term, that the idea of legitimizing the rest of the the nonconformity is not ripe then, for decision. Then you certainly don't have to. Well, yeah. All right. Mitch, do you want to make a motion? Uh, sure. I move that we approve the 24 foot variance. Second. And the, the rationale questions? is as stated by Hank, which who had described it very well in his analysis, minus any argument about legitimizing the existing nonconformity. Hmm. Okay. So to be A Adam, you seconded, right? Second. Yep. Any further discussion among the commissioners? So to be clear, Mr. Chair, uh, if I might, so what you're looking at is that uh, the area is not visible to the public and uh, no adverse communications from the neighbors. The uh, house and layout were all in place prior to the Cates impending purchase. The original design created the issue. I mean, we're dealing and, with an architectural, a bit of architectural irrationality yeah, that yeah. has been corrected by enclosing that space. That is correct. <clears throat> okay, uh, I look for a vote. All those say aye. 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 Any negatives? The motion carries. Thank you, Adam, you vote. Thank you, everybody. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's move on to the next issue. Hmm. Okay. The next issue would be Mr. Avedians, who I don't see here. I do see Ellie Moscow, who's a neighbor, but I don't see. He's here. Oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, Hank, I'm sorry, but I'm using my wife's desktop and screen because my, uh, so you've, you've my been webcam hearing it went out just before the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't you go ahead then, Ray, if it's a pleasure in the chair. Um, one small, are we talking about A366 Huntington Road? We are indeed, sir. Thank you. My wife, Lori, and I live at 8366 Huntington. Ellie Mosco, who's also uh, visible, uh, but is muted at the point. Ellie, unmute yourself. Hello. There's Ellie and her husband, Anthony. Um, working together, we would like to put in a shadow box fence between our two, uh, along our property line between our two residences. Uh, and in doing so, have a shadow box fence that they had already put in um, on their back lot line. Now come forward along our joint property line. Um, and we think it would serve a number of purposes. We feel like uh, we have to get a variance because basically of the opacity requirements. Um, and I, I fully understand, and I know that Ellie and Anthony do too, and my wife does, um, the point of the opacity requirements going back and going forward. Um, but in this case, we think that a variance is justified. And um, what we would like to do is have the same shadow box fence that is going along the back of the Moscow's property line Rear, rear lot line come forward in the same form um, and replace an existing picket fence that has approximately a half inch gap between the pickets. Whereas, whereas a shadow box fence, um, when you're looking at it, at it from dead on, doesn't appear to be uh, have opacity. Um, but if you look at it from an angle, you can see that uh, you can see sideways through the fence a short distance beyond uh, either side of the fence. Um, the shadow box fence that uh, is now in place that we'd like to bring forward is very attractive. We see a lot of it in the woods and um, it, it still allows for proper airflow. Um, it does have a couple of extra uh, things that we we like about it in terms of its structure, and that's outlined in the letter to to you on the board. Um, we have we both have small dogs. Uh, let's just call both of them interesting dogs. Our dog is uh, been known to, and he's he's a very good dog, but he's been known to. A nip at the heels of our grandchildren. And one of the things that we are concerned about as we choose a style of fence coming forward is something that the kids can't put their fingers through um, on either side. We don't want to have a, a little tragedy. Um, but the overall reason, and there's, there's other reasons, we've had a big problem along Huntington Road, particularly, I guess, because of the zoo with skunks this year. I mean, it's been, it's reached almost critical terms. Um, and so one of the things we've tried to do amongst ourselves, at least at this end of Huntington, uh, but all probably all the way down almost to Linda Solomon's place is everybody wants to figure out a way to keep skunks from coming into our backyard, side yards uh, from any direction. And by having, um, certain styles of fence that uh, make it very difficult for a skunk to get through. That makes it easier uh, to keep them out. But overall, the important thing, the most important thing is we don't, we would like to carry the shadow box design all the way forward to where the existing fence that it would replace ends. And that I believe requires a variance. <clears throat> Kelly and Anthony, have I, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think you're covering it. I mean, the current fence is barely opaque as it is, and we're basically trying to replace an old fence with a nicer looking new fence that will 
serve the purposes of continuity within our properties and you know make everything look nice um, and also have various safety uh, elements to it too as far as you know fingers not going in yeah. between I mean we have small children Ray and his wife have grandchildren that, that come over I mean so there's also other little safety um, equities involved there and we're not trying to make it so you can't see over it we're talking at that point a four foot fence so it's still um, plenty of visibility there uh, we, we, we like our neighbors we want to see our neighbors but we also want to keep our yard separate and looking nice <clears throat> Thank you. Hank, we need to vote on a four foot fence? You, what you're voting for, no. The four foot fence can go into place because of where Mr. Vedian's property is and the way that it's set up. He's got a side door, so he comes in front of that. He's entitled to that. What he's not entitled to, unfortunately, is the opacity issue, which he addressed. Um, but if it's all right with you, perhaps I'll throw up the PowerPoint. I can show you a little bit more about where it is and what he's proposing. Yes, please do. Okay, hold on just a second here. Uh, okay, can we see that? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so basically what they're looking for is they have a four foot fence that they're entitled to and I'm going to kind of do this a little bit differently. I'm going to go to the drawing before I go to the standards. This is the Avedian property here. Um, this is the fence that they don't need a variance for because this is going right here to the back of the property. So they can have this anywhere into here and have a six foot fence. Um, actually, the truth be told, if Mr. Avedian, now that I'm looking at this, is pulling the permit for it, then he can have up to where this line is here as a six-foot fence. This line from here forward has to be a four-foot fence because it's his property line matches the back of his house. And this was originally going to match the back of this house. And what they should be doing is matching this house, and that necessitates a lesser variance. So what happens here is that from this point forward, they want a four foot fence, or maybe from this point forward, they want the four foot fence. That's fine. The opacity issue is what the problem is. So the situation that they have is, is that they would have a wood picket fence there now, which would be fine, um, but it doesn't necessarily serve their purposes. Both neighbors have young kids that are there. Um, there's dogs involved, which is fine. And normally you could take the tack and say, well, uh, maybe control the dog. Then they throw in the skunk factor, which is the only way to really keep that out is to put some kind of board there and to make sure that you're as low to the ground so they don't get in. Um, skunks, unfortunately, are a fact of life in Huntington Woods and that area has been harder hit than most. Uh, so there is a way to keep that out of there and that would be it. The original purpose of the no six foot privacy fence in that area in the side yard was to gain light and not block people's windows so the natural light wouldn't block them and also to keep the airflow going. With a shadow box fence at four feet in height, that extra two feet that would have blocked out the light is no longer an issue. So the four foot privacy fence, that's one thing that's taken off of it that may help you make up your mind with that. The second thing is, is that the airflow. With the shadow box style, you don't really inhibit the airflow. It still can flow through. What it does is it keeps little hands and dogs from reaching in there. And it's also uh, small enough that it would be hard pressed for a skunk to get through, which is a concern of Mr. Vedian's. So having said that, that's what we're looking at. The gate that returns here, he's allowed to have a gate that returns here. Um, the Moscow's are showing a four foot wood gate on their side, which goes to the back deck issue there. So he can have the four foot fence here that's a privacy fence if that's what the board wants to allow. Um, the guess that he went down to four feet here is to have more light and it served the needs with the kids and protected against the dog. So it was uh, in, in what I would surmise to be in his mind, a win-win for everybody. And I believe the Moscow's are, are in agreement with this. So having said that, I'll go back to the standards and take a look at this. And uh, again, the special or unique conditions and circumstances. 
Um, the request on a shared lot line is situated in such a place as to allow for the screening uh, for the Avedian property and extra space for the Moscow family. If that gate was to be moved up, which they could do, then they would gain the space on the other side of the property. With the gate there, they, they can find the family and the young family to the backyard. Whichever it is, that wouldn't be a problem because they wouldn't need the approval for that. But the fence going forward, um, again, it can go there. It's the opacity. The gates are proposed to be open metal, so there's no issue there um, as far as the animals getting through. But the open metal would have like a finer spindles, so it would also keep the animals out. Um, it's a 32-foot section. It would keep the dogs and kids separated. Uh, that would meet standard one or at least could be thrown in as, as a discussion for standard one. And then standard two, the variance will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the general welfare. The only two affected people are here tonight and they're both in agreement. Um, it would have little to no impact to the public because there would be such a minimal part of this fence visible to anybody in the public. Uh, the only ones that would be objecting to it or that could have a problem with it would be uh, Mr. Vedian or the Moscow family. Standard three, the special considerations and circumstances don't result uh, from the actions of the applicant. Um, again, this is more of a byproduct of the families trying to be good neighbors to each other um, and keeping on one serving also as a function of keeping unwanted animals out of the yard and keeping their families safe. The layouts were predetermined to either family having taken ownership. So the door was where it was, you know, before um, Mr. Vedian's family took ownership of it. And the side yard was the side yard before the Moscow family moved into there. Uh, so the layouts are what they are. Um, but having said that, if this isn't done this way, then Mr. Vedian would feel like um, he's not getting the full use of his property and the Moscow's may have concern for the young kids as would Mr. Avedian. Standard four is going to be the literal interpretations of the provision of this ordinance would deprive the applicants of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district under the terms of this ordinance and the variance is a minimum necessary. They've already shown you a map which shows how the whole wall is delineated as a six foot wall that goes along the back, returns up to the side between the Abedian property and the Moscow property. It's somewhat unique is that both parties want this to accommodate their lifestyle. While this is not something a lot of residents have or something that we run across, it's unusual that both parties actually want this. Um, and the result is unlikely to harm no one since the uh, borders and other, the no borders other than theirs are affected by it. So again, what we're looking at here is this area for 32 feet, uh, returning back to the Vedian property. And then we have this right here, which is the area that would be picked up as four foot. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And I'm sure that, you know, Ray could take a whack at explaining anything more or elaborating on their needs, as I'm sure the Moscow family could too. So Mr. Chairman, if you have any other questions, we're here for you. Thanks, Hank. Are there any commissioners who wish to uh, discuss the issue? Ah. We're, no, that's you. Perhaps huh? public participation first. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, there we go. <clears throat> any commissioners who want to uh, make any comments first? Okay, not seeing any, then I will open public participation on this particular issue. Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak? And if you do, please give us your name and address. Not seeing any, I will close the public participation part of this meeting and I'm looking to the commissioners for more discussion. Mitch, go ahead. I, I, I was, was saying preface that I think it may be well known by now that I'm very pro fence. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind having <laughs> a 10, 10 foot brick wall there myself, but um, <laughs> That's a, un, that I would say runs against the tide under our zoning ordinance. I would agree with that statement. <laughs> uh, the issues of dogs, small children, skunks, 
So I sort of wonder where the skunks are going to go if they can't go through this yard. Won't they go to somebody else? Yes. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that all of those specifics are things that the city commission could have had in mind when they adopted this fence regulation. Because the possibility of small children, dogs, even skunks, I guess, is, is out there. And it seems universal. The, the question in my mind is, if we approve this, there's no real practical difficulty here of locating the fence with the appropriate opacity, which could be a chain link fence. Um, we're, we're in effect amending the zoning ordinance because remember the discussion about precedent. I can't see any basis for denying any appeal that comes along where people say, look, we have an existing fence. We want to replace it with, with better materials that provide better screening, more safety, you know, children fingers, keep skunks out or what have you. It's just means that we're nullifying the law. And the question is, do we want to do that? Whereas it might be more appropriate for the city commission to have another look at this, and particularly if there are types of fences that don't really cause the kinds of problems that op opaque fences are supposed to cause because they let air through and they're not so tall, et cetera, et cetera. Then I, I don't know how to handle this because it really strikes me as even though harmless on the one hand and clearly a great improvement to their property. I, th I the think the rationale is not all that clear. I think one thing, um, perhaps, and I'll just throw it out there, and then you folks can discuss it if you would like, is um, the other thing that is, is that the rest of the property all has a shadow box fence. So if you want to consider architectural compatibility something, then they would be continuing the architectural fence uh, as a shadow box, albeit down to four feet, so to comply with that portion of the ordinance. Well, that's self-created, though, because they're just building on something that was installed to start with. Well, but that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, if their their interest would be to continue the type of fence, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not making the, the, the case is what the case is, but that would be another rationale is that they want to have the same type of fence right. that already exists there, but they would drop the height of it to match the four-foot height that we require in the side yard. And the argument would be is that by essentially using a shadow box fence, that the reasons for the privacy fence, which would have been the height and the airflow, which were two of the main reasons that the fence was deleted from the ZO in the six foot height in the side yard, would no longer be an issue. That's what I'm seeing from this. That doesn't mean that that's what you're seeing from it. Is, so is there any basis for us to interpret a shadow box fence as being? not opaque under uh, given the understanding of what depending the depending on the angle that you look at it <laughs> well i'm um, asking that because if, we, we don't yeah. know how to do it but we also have the power to interpret an ordinance as opposed right. to granting a variance you could interpret it because if you take a look at a shadow box at 45 degree angle you're able to see right through it yeah i mean i think that's the tenor of the argument being made actually and that so, is the shadow boxes it does not offend the opacity requirement that's, and if that's the way that you want to go, you would be free to make that interpretation. The issue with that becomes that uh, if you take a look at it based on the angle that you look at it, you're seeing clear space through that. And that was the opacity issue that you had. If you had a solid wall, you're seeing nothing. The air was restricted, the light was restricted. With this type of fence, depending on the angle that you look at it at, you're not seeing that. So um, perhaps Mr. Avedian could speak to that because I'm going to guess that it's about a 45 degree angle that affords you a pretty clear view. Uh, I, I kind of yeah, like it, actually. So it's, it's a good thought, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Any other commissioners w wishing to uh, ask questions? I, I don't know if it's a question or a statement. We struggle with this fence one. And uh, I know when we passed the new um, uh, uh, guidelines are approved were approved and all that good stuff uh, and nobody touched the fence issue whatsoever and I was pretty disappointed at that point in time but I think what what it did do is 
it allows to what happened just here between the Bells and the Moscows. They, they, they were able to get together and look at this and have a, a neighborly conversation and came up with a solution. And, and that's why we're here to, to vet it out and listen to it and talk to it. Um, I don't know if we're, you know, violating any, any rules or regulations or whatever. I just think that um, the vagueness of this law tends to push people to have the, the adult conversation they need to have. Whereas if they were like Mitch, they'd build that wall 10 feet high and uh, not talk to any of their neighbors. I don't know. I mean, the, the, the ordinance does require you to get your neighbor's agreement if you're putting on a boundary yep, fence. So I agree. That, yep, that's absolutely. there anyway. That's yep. there anyway. Yep, I know. I got you. No, but anyways, I, I, I don't see any real big issue. I, I, I understand it. And I, the opaqueness issue with the, the, the box and the, the angle is interesting. It's intriguing, but that's all it is to me. Oh. Mitch? Well, I... I mean, I don't know how far to go with this because I can't tell what the sense of the body is here. I personally think that it would be that we are not warranted in granting a variance for this fence as much as I would like to. But I think that we could consider, if you, because of the arguments made about the character of the fence and how it actually functions in terms of letting light through at certain angles and letting air through, that we would interpret shadow box fences of this design to, to meet the opacity requirements, which I think, what is it, Hank, what percentage? 50%. So you can have your 50% if you're standing 50% of the time at a 45 degree angle. I mean, you know, there are a lot of ways of saying it, but I like that better because it's not, it doesn't force us to make a decision that we really do not have a valid reason for making. And that would let every type of fence appeal in. <coughs> The other thing that you do too, by if you take a look at it and also make your appeal or make your interpretation, which this may move to, that that particular style of fence is acceptable because it meets the intent of the ordinance, which was the light, the air, um, and that type of thing, then it would also make it easier for me going forward when I get fence permits for this type of thing this is what the ZBA's interpretation is, and, and shadow box fences in the side yard, as long as they're under four feet, four feet or under, would be okay. And I don't know that anybody's gonna have a problem with that because the whole issue with fences was when somebody opens their side window and they're five feet away from their neighbor's house and they're looking at a wood fence, that's what they didn't wanna see. But now if it's two feet lower and it's four feet, like uh, you know, Mr. Vidian and the Moscos have proposed here that that's a different animal so I agree with your actual uh, synopsis of this Mitch that perhaps an interpretation might be a better road to go with this well and plus if the commission is outraged by it they can amend the ordinance to say that four foot shadow box fences are not permitted and that would be that would be fine but that way you would have addressed your responsibility here this evening. And if they feel aggrieved by it or that that's not what they had in mind, they can take it up and clarify it. Well, I'm, is it time for a motion or? Okay, no. That's up yeah. to the chair. It is, it is, Mitch, I'm looking for one. All right, I move that we uh, interpret the zoning ordinance uh, requiring opaque, op fences with a sufficient degree of non-opacity to include a four foot shadow box fence in the side yard. Hank, is that, is that good? We've, we've got that. Okay. We'll be able to get that. I look for a second. I'll second that. Give it to Joe this time. <laughs> Any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Hank. Okay, there were no opposed, correct? No, I don't think there were there. All righty, thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Avedian, you have your fence. We'd like thank to thank, uh, we'd like to thank all of you uh, for your consideration and very interesting uh, result. Uh, Mitch, <laughs> appreciate that. And uh, going forward, maybe someday 
we'll get credit for allowing this type of fence to be put in uh, without any further argument. As long as it keeps the skunks out. I was just going to say, or or you're going to be uh, accused of pushing the skunks to everybody else. Uh, trust me, they're, we had a fence, they're on their way. <laughs> we had a fence walk across our patio a week or two ago. It's oh. not a welcome site. No, it's not a welcome site. Our neighbors on the other side, real quickly, uh, really got attacked. And their their entire yard is surrounded by a chain link fence. Well, you know, and they got in somehow. I'm telling you, it's bad. The both well, dogs got it. They a lot of wildlife around out. these days. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, right. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Chairman, you are now up to your last appeal of the evening. Apologies to Mr. Huffmaster for having to wait. Somebody's got to be last. I apologize. It was you. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Huffmaster. We will give you your time. You got it. Thank you, Hank, and, and thank you, Zoning Board of Appeals, for hearing my variance. Uh, my name is Brett Huffmaster. I reside at 13108 Lincoln Drive. Um, looking for a variance on lot coverage. I purchased my home in April of 2020. Uh, and the previous owner had removed a 22 by 20 garage because of structural concerns. Uh, I've submitted plans for the same 22 by 20 garage that would put my lot coverage at approximately 31.7%. And I'm looking to see, uh, get a variance on, uh, on that, please. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Hank? Yes. Okay. So basically what we're looking at here is a situation where Mr. Huffmaster, um, can you guys see that now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically what we have here is a, a situation where if the guy that sold them the house never took the garage down and he repaired the garage, we wouldn't be having the problem. He did take it down. And again, it goes to the nonconformity situations that when you have a nonconformity, it's reasonably expected that nonconformity will go away at some point in time. It went away. The problem is, is that leaves Mr. Huffmaster without a garage or a means of putting up a garage. The lot that he has is extremely unique, and we'll get into that. Um, but he represented, he was represented, or at least I understood Mr. Huffmaster to say that he was represented that the grandfather, that the garage was grandfathered. Um, unfortunately, something that's theirs, not grandfather. So we come to where we're at with this. Um, he's simply looking to have a garage. And according to standard one, special or unique conditions, circumstances exist, which are peculiar to the land structure or building involved, which are not generally applicable to other land structures or building in the same district. Here we have a unique situation. Obviously, a garage is a prudent use of property in a Michigan climate. Most all houses in the city have a garage. Now the lot that he has is irregular in that it is only a hundred feet deep. Even being in an R1E zone district, that's low. So with a hundred feet deep in the house and the front yard, he can't put up a garage unless he has a lot coverage. The lot is just small. If you take 50 by 100, that's 5,000 square feet. 50 by 125, which is what most of them are, and even the one that we had earlier uh, this evening was 107, he's only 100, so he's got 5,000 square feet. So right now, he's looking at a shed, basically, that he could put up, which does nothing for his vehicles. So these are the smallest step blocks in the cities, including any of them, uh, including on 11 mile, including the backs up to the city, the parks, or anything. Um, and the least number of square feet that he can apply for as a result is that for a 22 by 20 garage, you'd like to be able to pull two cars into it and be able to open the doors. So that's kind of where he's at. Um, and the concern is, is that he would be denied what would be a reasonable expectation for all residents in the city. And again, if it was a normal size lot, he wouldn't need to be here. Uh, he's further restricted again that his lot's only 100 feet deep. And this again is similar to the first appeal. Standard two, the variance will not be injurious to the neighborhood or otherwise detrimental to the general welfare. Um, this won't likely impact anyone as the garage of that size was there. 
it was there months ago. And garage again are is expected use. People expect to see a garage in the backyard. That's what they do. So that's the one thing. The standard for three, special conditions and circumstances do not result as an action, uh, from the actions of the applicant. The house existed as it currently sits. In order to accommodate the garage, Mr. Huffmaster would have to take a covered rear porch off the house to do so without a variance. And that would be unreasonable. <coughs> Excuse me. The house had a garage, which was built prior to the zoning code, um, which Mr. Huffmaster could have kept, except the previous owner demolished it. So either you kind of give him a garage or he has no place to put his cars or store anything. Uh, literal interpretation of the provisions of this ordinance, which is standard four, would deprive the applications of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district. And the variance is the minimum necessary. Um, the appellant is asking for a small two-car garage. This isn't huge by any stretch of the imagination. This is simply a garage that basically allows him to pull two cars in and open the door to get out. Uh, typ typical parking spaces, if you go like to Kroger's or any of those, are either eight or nine by 20. So he's got the 20, he's got the, so there's only two feet left to open the doors. So it's basically like trying to open your doors at a very tight Meyer parking lot or something like that as it is. He's not asking for anything huge. He's asking for a basic two car garage. And the failure to grant a variance would deprive him of a basic necessity that more lots have, uh, most all lots have, which would be a garage. Uh, it's normal to expect to have a garage in the neighborhood is comprised of homes that typically do have them. Here's what he's looking at doing. This is the simple, uh, design for what he has. And you can see how everything appears jammed on the lot. And that again is because the lot is only a hundred feet. So he has no room to work with here. He's maintaining the feet for the Edison easement, which does exist back here. So he's got to do that. And he's fine with this distance right here. Um, but he does have the problem that he's going to take up over 30%. So he's at 31.7%. The reality is, is that even with this garage, it's going to be very hard pressed for him to use the right bay of it. So he may end up putting one car in there and the rest for bicycles, lawnmowers, whatever, but it just further illustrates how impractical it is for him not to be able to have a garage or any storage on the property. So having said that, um, I'll let Mr. Huffmeister, Huffmaster add anything that he would like to to this. Uh, to Mr. Chair, if you or the board have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Um, a hundred foot lot is a problem and we recognize that. And part of the issue is, is that if you take a look at the way the lots are designed here, the sidewalk, which of course is city property, uh, in the, from the sidewalk to the curb, which is the right of way area here, is substantially larger than most. So ideally in a standard setup, a sidewalk would run closer to where my cursor is now. This area here would be part of his lot, which it isn't. And this problem would cease to exist other than the placement of the house would mess it up no matter where it is. So having said that, if you have any questions, Mr. Chair, we're happy to answer them. Thanks, Hank. Uh, uh, Brett, is there anything you wish to, to add to it? No, Hank, you did a great job on explaining that for me. So thank you. Okay, uh, any discussion among the commissioners? I've got a question, Hank, perhaps I'm confusing two different concepts, but aren't residences supposed to have certain space set aside for a garage, regardless is, of whether they have it? You're absolutely 100% right. And the problem is, is that this lot in this house predates the zoning ordinance. And once the previous owner took down the garage, it was, it was legal non-conforming at that point in time. And then as soon as the garage went down, he's left with nothing virtually that he can put up. So he needs the 1.7% lot coverage in order to effectively put up a garage of a meaningful size without going overboard. But you are 100% correct. There is supposed to be a set aside, but if the house is already built, there's not much that you can do about that. What, what would the size of the garage be if it did without violating the lot coverage requirement? Like 200 and uh, I want to say like 260 ballpark. 
So it would be barely a one car garage. Oh, I see. So it's a significant uh, variance. It's it's a significant, well, it's significant to Mr. Huffmaster in that it makes a garage usable. Well, I understand that, but I mean the, the amount of the variance in yeah, it's 1.7 percent. Yeah, it's 1.7 percent. So, like, I think the first garage per person today wanted a 20 by 20 garage. Yeah, which is even smaller. But I guess that that one would still violate the lot coverage here, even a 20 by 20. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Mitch. I'm having some. I'm hitting too many buttons. Is there anything I can do to help you out, Gordon? No. He, um, there we go. Better? Yep. Okay. That worked. Any other commissioners for a discussion? If not, I'm going to open it up to public participation. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to address this issue? Gordon, I'll address this issue. Gail Linden. Hi, Gail. If Hi. If Hank or anybody looked at the city records as to what size garage sat on that property before it came down, 20 it by was 22. 453 square feet. So it was even bigger than the 20 by 22 square foot garage that Mr. Huffmaster is asking for. And the reason that they are, it was a legal non-conforming garage, even though it was falling down, is because the zoning ordinance changed afterwards in order to make it an Ill, a legal non-conforming. When it was built, it wasn't illegal. It was okay for the time when it was built at its time. But the fact that it came down all the way, now it needs a variance. So asking for 440 feet when 440 was there definitely meets the standards of one, standard two, it's a unique property in standard four that it denies him special privileges that other people, you know, and it's not really a special privilege, it's just a privilege that other people can enjoy. That's what I have to say about it. Thank you, Gail. Any other members of the public wish to make a comment? If not, I'm going to uh, throw it back to the commissioners for more discussion and a motion. Silence. <clears throat> okay, does, well, uh, you know, I'm asking for motions. So does anybody want to create another motion? <clears throat> I think what you're looking at here, if, Mr. Chairman, if I can uh, interject for something is, is that, um, Basically, if you don't make a motion and approve some form of garage for him, you're basically denying him a garage, which is the same thing that every other property in the zone district has. The houses without garages are limited and it also detracts from the value. Um, so, I mean, those are just a couple things for discussion or consideration and perhaps the board wants to ask some questions or discuss that. I don't know. I just want to make sure that all the facts are out there. For I think I'd like to make a motion to approve, but I always butcher this. So <laughs> I, want to make a, I want to make a motion to approve based on the fact that uh, he should have a garage because everybody else has a garage. So help me out with which that meets. Well, I think is that the issue here is that the um, lot is unusually small and, and a, a bigger piece of, of the area between the street and the rear of the, of the property is taken up by city right of way, which apparently, I didn't know this, but doesn't count apparently in the, Correct. In the lot size ratio. Correct. So those are two very striking facts that create a practical difficulty for building a garage, which clearly is an expected use of property in Huntington. So motion to approve based on the practical difficulty of the size of the property and the proximity of the lot line. And the reasonable expectation of having an accessory structure in the name of a garage, namely a garage on a piece of property in Huntington Woods. Yeah. 
it also satisfies the minimum, the idea of, of the variance being the minimum necessary. Okay, Hank, do you have all the information for, for the motion? Yeah, it's it, they, it records everything that we say yeah. gets recorded to the cloud, and then hopefully the person that's been checking this out is looking at it and saying that she wants to do our minutes, and she'll get it. If not, I'll help right. her because all of this will be there for her to read. It's pretty straight. This one's pretty straightforward. Yeah, so, I, I think so. I think that so. said, I accept all the piggybacks to my motion. Right. I am looking for a second. Second. Thanks, Todd. Any other further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, Mr. Huffmeister, you, master, sorry about that. Good for you. <clears throat> it, was, it was worth your wait, Brett. Yeah, you know, you had, to, oh, almost two hours, wow. <clears throat> well worth it. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll look for some plans for you coming in. You got it, appreciate All right, it. Thanks. So much, yep. Take care. All right, uh, any further general business? Yes, Mr. Chairman, just so that you are aware, um, once again, we're dealing with the fact that uh, we're, we're having trouble with finding somebody that can do the minutes on a consistent basis, so it keeps getting bounced back and forth. So that was the reason that the person was taking a look at this to see what they can do. So I appreciate you bearing with us on this, but uh, we, I believe, and I'll find out tomorrow if this is something that they're interested in doing, and if it is, um, we'll start to be transcribing and have the minutes to you on a much more regular basis. The problem is, is that I can't, I can't take them and be involved in the meetings. It's just too, right. yeah, you know. Right. No, I, I understand. You need somebody else so, to, to take yeah. the minutes. So, and we, we've had them in the past, and it's just the person is, and we even tried the city clerk, but there might be a small election coming up, which is totally negated any time that she has to do any of it. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion? I, if you're taping these meetings, then it seems to me we could cut down on, on the um, – voluminous nature of the minutes it might make well, it easier to get somebody to do them. yeah they, we do i mean basically it's not doesn't have to be a verbatim thing but with the zoning board of appeals in particular it's important to, to have the discussion on there that creates the record or basis for an I, approval or a denial I, so the zba minutes might tend to be a little bit more extensive than uh the arts beautification committee or well, something like that so i, I don't do yeah, I don't disagree with that, but the point yeah. is that we, if the motion is sufficient and we have a tape recording, so if anything was ever litigated, you'd have the record complete. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. It and seems that's to me it would take the burden off somebody have to write all the backing and forthing between the commission. Right. Well, there, I mean, it can be as much as a general discussion was held with these yeah. being the key points. You know, I mean, you could cut down a lot of it, so... But um, yeah, I, I just think that the record's important and the city feels the same way. The Zoning Board of Appeals is unique in that it's a quasi-judicial body. So as a result, it's gotta be right. No, no question, but if you have a, a taped or a videotape record, then you're in good shape anyway. Right, but we need the body and that's what we're trying to find, <laughs> so. All right. I used to think that too. <laughs> when I was in commercial construction many years ago, I learned right away that you took the minutes to the meeting and- Hi guys, I got a, I got a split. Right so I, I agree with any subsequent motion to adjourn or otherwise. <laughs> Thanks, man. I have to open it up for public participation one more time for anybody who wants to discuss. Anybody have anything to say? Thank you, I will close the uh, public participation part of the meeting and I'm looking for a motion to, uh, what, what are we doing? We're, oh, to, to, to stop. Ah. Adjourn. Adjourn. Motion, Thank you. motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, everybody. Thanks, Appreciate guys. it. Yep. Thank you, guys. You, got, you guys are great. Yep. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Mitch. Good to see you.